Hi, and welcome to Socratic Studios. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science-related with the best minds in the field. I'm Vishnu, and this episode will be the recent discovery of 16 species of ultra-black fish in the Gulf of Mexico and the Monterey Bay. With me today, I have Mr. Alexander Davis of Duke University, a member of the team that made this discovery. Welcome, Mr. Davis. It's an honor to have you on the podcast. Uh, can you provide a brief overview of what uh, ultra-black material is? Sure. So we've been defining an ultra-black material as something that reflects less than a half a percent of light that hits it. So that would make it something like 20 times blacker than a black sheet of paper or 10 times blacker than fresh asphalt, for comparison. Cool. So um, through doing some research, I found that some of the first ultra-black animals to be discovered were birds of paradise. Um, What was the method that these birds used to absorb so much light? Sure. So these birds and some other animals like them are taking a pigment like melanin, which is what makes human hair skin dark, and they're embedding that within a structure. So they've got this branched feather structure, and that creates a lot of scattering. So light bounces around within that structure, and it has more chances to be absorbed by melanin. Got it. Um, so you and your collaborators were able to find 16 species of previously unidentified ultra-black fish in the Monterey Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. What was the method that these fish use uh, as opposed to uh, the birds to absorb so much light? Good question. Um, In the birds, you have a structure that does the scattering and a pigment that does the absorption. In the case of the fish, they've got spherical pigment organelles or ellipsoids so kind of like a tic-tac shaped pigment organelle and those ellipsoids are doing both the scattering and the absorption so the principles are the same but in the case of the fish we've got uh, the pigment doing both functions essentially so imagine a gumball machine filled with tic-tacs shrunken down to a really small size and that's what the skin structure looks like So in your opinion, I'm not sure if this is even a valid question, but in your opinion, which is more efficient or which is a better method? I think it depends a bit on what you're going for, but we think that the fish may have more potential technological applications because you're doing the scattering and the absorption with the same component. And it also doesn't rely on a structure, right? So if you imagine something like Vanta Black, which is a synthetic ultra black material made out of carbon nanotubes, that structure piece is really important and that makes it prone to damage. So you can crush the structure or something like that. And that reduces the ability for melanin to you know, absorb light. In the case of the fish, you can't really crush these small particles. So you just need a random arrangement of all of the particles and that gets you the same effect. Got it. Um, so from an, from an evolutionary perspective, why would these fish develop such adaptations? Another good question. In the deep sea, we see four primary types of camouflage. One is to make yourself transparent. So just let as much light through your body as possible. We also see mirrored animals, which use uh, guanine crystals to essentially make themselves into a vertical mirror, which works pretty well in the open ocean. We see counter illumination, which is replacing your shadow essentially with light from organs on your belly. But all of those strategies have the issue of surface reflection. So if you have a directed light source, like from bioluminescence, you get reflections from the surface of those animals that can reveal you to a predator or to prey if you are the predator. And with something like ultra black skin, you reduce that reflected so low, you're reflecting so little light that uh, you appear to blend in with the infinite black water behind you, right? So once you're below about a thousand meters, there's no sunlight left and you're essentially trying to match, you know, a thousand miles of water behind you that doesn't reflect very much light what sort of what sorts of predators are they trying to escape so some of these animals themselves are predators 
like the anglerfish. And in their case, you know, they're holding what is essentially a light bulb above their head. And you don't want to illuminate your face and give yourself away to a prey item before it can get close enough. In the case of some of the smaller fish, they're actually trying to escape some of the big fish in this set of ultra black ones. So we have a few larger predatory dragonfish, um, like the threadfin dragonfish. And these guys are maybe a foot to a foot and a half long. So not that big by surface fish standards, but they're giants relative to some of the other fish down there. And so that's who they're running away from. Yeah. What you said about the angler fish is interesting because I thought these fish would uh, would have these adaptations to escape from bioluminescence or to like sort of counter bioluminescence. That's interesting that that they're using it in tandem with bioluminescence. Um, yeah, we also see some ultra black skin around the gut of a few of these animals. And if you can imagine swallowing something that's bioluminescent, if it's still glowing inside your belly, then you're going to give yourself away, right? You're just swimming around with a flashlight inside of your stomach. And so we see ultra black skin around the stomach of a few of these fish. Yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned uh, uh, some other forms of camouflage in the deep sea. Um, why did the 16 species that you discovered uh, choose the, or like adapt in the ultra black way rather than any of those other um, adaptations? Part of that is selection bias. So we knew we were looking for dark, darkly colored fishes, essentially. So any that were mirrored or that were transparent, we weren't taking measurements from those. So a bit of it's selection bias, but also we were sampling really deep water. So most of our trawls were below 1,000 meters all the way down to maybe 2,000 meters, where there's hardly any sunlight left and these, those other strategies become less effective. So we were sampling sort of the sweet spot as far as habitat goes, and we were only picking the the darkest fish. Okay. Um, can you sort of like explain the pros and cons of each of those camouflage techniques? Of course. So transparency is really great if you can do it well. Um, you know, it's nice to just have a predator see right through you and not know you're there but you have a few major disadvantages. The first is that it's difficult to make your whole body transparent, right? It requires some reorganization of cells. It requires you to limit blood flow. It requires usually that you be really thin. You can't have sort of a wide bodied animal that's gonna be effectively transparent. Um, so those are some of the big issues with transparency. Mirroring works well. Um, when you have sunlight, you've got this nice diffuse light source but it doesn't work quite as well when you shine a flashlight at it. So if you shine a flashlight at the mirror in your bathroom, right, it's going to appear really bright. It's going to blind you. Um, and so that's the issue that these fish run into when there's a predator that has a searchlight or something like that. So um, why did you choose to conduct your study in the Gulf of Mexico and the Madre Bay? Part of it is opportunity and part of it is species richness. So opportunity first, there aren't that many chances to go to sea on a research vessel that's focused on trawling that is going to be sampling the depths that you care about, right? So these opportunities, I've been fortunate in getting on a bunch, but that's still only three total in my three years of grad school. So, uh, Part of it is just what was available to us. Um, and the other piece is that Monterey Bay tends to be a good place to sample because it's a canyon. And when deep water currents meet the canyon, they sort of force deeper water animals up closer to the surface. So it's easier to trawl for them. Got it. Um, so since the fish you're looking for are ultra black, it must have been really difficult to find them, actually. So how did you manage to actually gather samples to to conduct your study upon? Yeah, sampling the deep sea is a bit of a guessing game. So my advisor likes to use the analogy of flying over London or New York City with a grappling hook and just seeing what you pick up with that grappling hook. Uh, we essentially take a 50 or 60 foot long net and we drop it down to 1,000 meters, 2,000 meters, wherever we want to sample and we drag it through the water really slowly for maybe six hours. 
And when we pull it up, we usually have, I don't know, 20 or 30 fish and of them, a handful are useful and most are not. So it's, it's an inefficient sampling process. And we, we do those trawls once or twice a day for two weeks and hope to have enough fish to find something interesting. Is there any like advanced uh, technology that you use to scan the water or is it just like a net in a boat? It's mostly a net in a boat. So it hasn't <laughs> evolved very far. The net has some, some nice features in that it can open. You can send a signal to open it at the right depth and you can close it at the right depth so you know where you're sampling. Um, it's got this nice insulated end where all of the contents go and you can shut that. And so when you bring things up, you can keep them cold and keep it dark for them. And then you can open that up in the dark and actually still get some fish or usually crustaceans that are still alive at the surface. So there, there are some advancements there, but for the most part, you know, you're, you're just operating on years of experience from the people who run the net. Yeah. So once you did capture these fish, um, what sorts of tests did you run and like what kind of data did you gather? So on board the ship, we're mostly just taking the fish and using what's called a back reflectance probe, which is just a fancy photon counter, essentially, to measure the reflectance from the skin in water. Um, that's the only measurement we do on board the ship. We then take skin samples back and we'll do various forms of uh, light microscopy or electron microscopy to look at the skin structure. And once we have details about what the skin looks like, we're usually doing some sort of computational modeling where we're building the structure on the computer. We're able to tweak it and look at which parts of the structure are actually important for minimizing reflectance and which parts are just, you know, for something else, essentially. So now I've got like more of like a personal question. Um, what was your favorite species of fish that you that you found? I think it's a tie for me. Wow, this is actually a hard question. Uh, it's sort of a three-way tie. So I'm partial to the blackest species that we found. It's a tiny angler fish, maybe about two inches long. Um, and it was just so shockingly black that I, I have a bit of an attachment to that one. We're also pulling up most of these trawls at maybe three in the morning. So, you know, you're a little bit sleep deprived and extra excited when something good comes up. Um, but two other interesting ones, we had a pelican eel, which is not a species normally caught in trawls. They have this giant expandable mouth and the rest of their body is just a super thin eel-like body. And it was uh, snagged on the outside of the net. So we almost didn't find it. It had managed to get hooked on the outside of the net somehow and traveled for hours through the water and made it onto the deck. So those two were really exciting. And the third one is the threadfin dragonfish that I mentioned before. The We managed to get a sample alive at the surface and we got to see it bioluminesce and flash this electric blue all over its body. And it was really, really cool. We managed to get a video of it and everything. How do we build ultra black materials in the lab right now? And what can we learn from, from studying these uh, fish and other ultra black animals? So right now, the blackest materials that we make in labs are typically grown from carbon nanotubes. So Vanta Black and the other derivatives thereof are essentially growing a forest of these really thin carbon nanotubes that makes this incredibly matte black color. I think when we talk about ultra black inspiration from animals, I suspect most of them won't get quite as black as Vanta Black. There's just some benefits to using carbon nanotubes and uh, precisely engineered materials that animals don't have, like, they can't take advantage of that. Um, where we see those being important are for making more robust materials that are still close to Vanta Black. So, like I mentioned before, uh, Anything that relies on a specific structure, you risk damaging that structure and losing all of that absorption. And with something like the fish, we're hoping that maybe you can get something that absorbs 99.95% of the light instead of 99.99, .99, 
but you could use it outdoors or it's going to last longer or something like that. So you're like essentially trying to make these materials more durable. Yes. Okay. Yep. And also I'm going to backtrack a little bit because I, I forgot my question earlier, but um, why, why are all of these uh, deep sea fish like so small? Is it because of the pressure of the ocean or? A lot of it has to do with energetics. So the deeper you go to a point, there's some variation in there, but the deeper you go, the less food is available. Um, if you think about the food chains in surface waters, you've got phytoplankton, they're getting energy from the sun, and then they're being eaten by zooplankton and small fish and then larger fish. As you go deeper, there are no more phytoplankton and you're relying on uh, anything that falls from the surface, essentially, and what you can scavenge in the deep sea. And so by having limited food sources, we see smaller and smaller animals with the occasional giant. There really are some large deep sea animals like the giant squid or some swordfish dive really deep um, and even some large anglerfish. So they're not all really small, but for the most part, they're pretty tiny. So are, are the bigger ones like do they are they less active? Do they move less or? You know, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I, I um, wish I could give you more, but something like a giant squid, I suspect, moves around, around just fine. And that's probably the largest animal you're going to find down there. Yeah. And also, um, what about those like giant worms and stuff? Because those are all the way at the bottom of the ocean, but they're pretty big, right? The tube worms? Yes. So once you get to the bottom of the ocean, things get a little bit larger again. So a lot of the largest deep sea fish that you might find are going to be towards the bottom. And that's because things settle there and you can create a new ecosystem based on everything that settles on the bottom. Whereas when you're up in the water column, it's just whatever's passing through that day. There's no way for it to accumulate there and potentially build up some sort of food source. Got it. Um, yeah, those are pretty much all of the questions I had. Uh, thank you so much for, for agreeing to be on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me.